Okay, I, I can take care of that. Yeah. Well, it looks like um, we're, we're missing a, a quite a crew. Uh, looks like the ladies are uh, vacant today. Some of the ladies are off doing something. Um, and it looks like this side over here is is regaining their their position as being the side that's more popular. This is the dominant side. Well, I don't know. Right now. <laughs> I don't know. You guys don't look, don't look so tough anymore. That's we got to We're tough. Pray, pray for that side over there. <laughs> okay, I'll lean a little bit more on this to help you guys out. Um, yeah, it's great to have you guys. You know, I, I, I as Terry's mentioning in his, uh, you know, giving praise, uh, we just thank God for every single one of you guys. Every single one of you is precious. And, uh, you know, this isn't uh, the most glamorous looking church. Uh, there's plenty of, of that going on in town. And you could, you could give, you have your pick of the litter out there. You guys can choose other churches, but you choose to come here. And, and that just, it thrills me that you guys have chosen to spend our, your Sundays with us. That together, we are here to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. We are here to lift up our Lord Jesus Christ. We are here to worship the Lord together. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming with this intent. Let's worship the Lord together. I'd like to ask you to please stand as I read from the Word of God this morning. Uh, this week, I got to listen to a uh, recording of one of our own, uh, Exon here. He was uh, uh, giving a message in town, and uh, it was recorded, and it was really a beautiful message. And it came from Isaiah 55, and so I wanted to share that passage with you today. Um, I'm going to read Isaiah 55. Hope, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have money, come by, come by and eat. Yes, come buy wine, milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me, here and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel. For he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, it may, it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me void but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in one thing for which I sent it. For thou shalt go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorns shall come up cypress tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Isaiah 55. There's so much in this chapter. There's so much in here. It's, you see of all creation worshiping the Lord there at the end. The trees clapping their hands. These are things we think of as animate. Inanimate. 
and, and yet the Lord speaks to them, speaks of them as worshiping him. All of creation worships him. That's what the word of God tells us. And then he tells us there's holy one coming out of Israel, that the nations are going to run to him. Isn't that us? Praise be to God that he's opened up the wonderful covenant and promise to us as well. All right, let's take your hymnals and let's turn to number 178. Let's start with number 178. <laughs> this week on um, the passion of Christ, the passion of Christ that he endured. Oh, 
2.11. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. <laughs>
is risen. He is, risen indeed. is he indeed? indeed? Indeed he is. Indeed he is. Next week is uh, our celebration of Easter Sunday. And uh, we are going to... I'd like to do a little bit of a different message next week. Because I, I don't think I need to convince anybody in this room that he is risen. what they do is they give me enough rope to hang myself. That's what that's all about. Thank you, Lauren. So what I want to do next week in our Easter message is uh, talk about what that means to us. What does the resurrection of Jesus Christ mean to me? And when I uh, move on into the next world, what, what word would you guys use? Is transition okay? Are you guys okay with the word transition? Promoted. When I transition to the next life? Promoted. What's that? Promoted. Promoted. I like that. Uh, there probably are a lot of synonyms. Everybody would have a, a word that would describe that. Well, what will I see when I open my eyes because of what Christ did for me? And uh, the Bible talks about that, and, uh, and we'll look at that. Uh, what, what do we have in front of us? And uh, I do, uh, we're missing half our folks, but we still have quite a few here today. And uh, praise the Lord for that. Uh, Roma and I were talking. Roma is the um, uh, smartest person I know. And uh, uh, we were talking about our, our life's journeys. And uh, one important thing for, for the parents in the room and to your kids your parents believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That's why they're here. They believe that. And uh, I would, uh, you know, the prayer there, uh, particularly for our young folks, is that there never is a time when you're not in a good church. Fellowshipping physically, not on a, not on a screen, per se, uh, in a um, satellite or anything like that, but, you know, where there's physical interaction with other believers. That is so important. It is just so important. So they've got you here for that purpose. So please, uh, always, always look to the Lord in that way. Well, today, there we are. You see that, that straight red <coughs> arrow there? <laughs> yeah, it points to where we're at. We're going to study the Noahic Covenant, the Covenant of Noah. It's a masterpiece uh, in displaying God's grace toward man. Just a masterpiece. And this is my all-time favorite covenant from God. All-time favorite. In these, we're going to cover the, the, the covenant of Noah in a single message. Um, but we leave a lot of meat on the bone when we do that. Because I want to keep going through these covenants. Uh, as we drive toward a look at how these covenants then fit into God's master plan. As he gets on into what the end times particularly with the rapture and beyond. The covenants play a huge part in that and give us great insight into what God is going to do. So as we go through these, I'm moving quickly and we leave a lot of meat on the bone, but as I have been studying these, I see a more in-depth study of the book of Genesis in our future. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. We'll see somewhere down the road. Um, if we study every subject we want to study before the Lord comes back, do you know how old we would be when the Lord comes back? Pretty old. We would be pretty old. So, slide two, please, Lauren. So, the covenant of Noah ushers in what we call the dispensation, the third dispensation. It, 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 it brings in the dispensation of human government. Human government. After this flood the flood of Noah, God removed the threat of divine judgment in the form of a flood. Remember what he said? He said, I'm never going to do this again. He did not remove the threat of divine judgment. Okay, it's important to realize that. He just made it clear that it would not be in the form of another flood. Because there is judgment coming to those that don't accept Christ. So to replace that solution to sin... God says, okay, I'm not going to flood you anymore, but to help you 
can it curtail or contain sin? The human nature, human government was instituted uh, to stop that from happening. Human government. And although it doesn't entirely prevent sin, does it? Uh, a correctly structured system of human government, it works sufficiently to curb lawlessness as long as those in government hold themselves to the same standard they enforce upon the people. That's important to realize. Human government, God is going to institute that, and we're going to see uh, how this all works. And, and as we work into our uh, Life Network study, our, our focus uh, next month, you'll see a connection there too. If those who oversee it, us in our government as our representatives, oversee, I guess is even a bad word, Justin um, said some things about representation that really struck home with me, and he's right. These people are not above us. They are our representatives, okay? So if those that oversee government abuse their power, everyone loses respect for the government, and then the government crumbles. It's the inevitable uh, rinse and repeat that we see in history. So this amazing piece of work, and I mean it is amazing, piece of work that we call the, the Covenant of Noah, will have impact on man right up to the time of eternity. Next slide, please, Lauren. Before we look at the texts that apply to this covenant, I wanted to take a quick overview of what's in this covenant, okay? First of all, Genesis 9, 5, and 6, man is made responsible to protect the sanctity of life. That was God's number one objective. He put government in place to protect the sanctity of human life. When government fails to protect human life, government has failed. And that was by giving an orderly rule over the individual man, uh, even to the inclusion, you will see in Romans 13, 1 through 7, of capital punishment <coughs> for those who take a life. Okay, God's view and his value of human life drives everything that has to do with human government. And in our view, that includes the unborn, and that includes the elderly. Genesis 8, 21, and 9, 11 through 16, no additional curse is placed, uh, and man does not need to fear another universal flood. That's another part of this uh, covenant. And then, in Genesis 8, 22, and 9, 2, the order of nature is kept in place. What we're talking about here is the animal kingdom is going to continue to fear man. And that, that started in the Edenic Covenant in Genesis 1.28. Next slide, please, Lauren. <coughs> Excuse me. Genesis 9.3, the flesh of animals is added to human diet. Praise God. Right? We were just over at the Ray's house last night and had grilled hamburgers. It was awesome. So God foresaw the need that we would need protein to keep up the workload for what he gave us in this covenant. So protein is introduced. Then you've got Genesis 9.25, and this is a declaration that the descendants of Canaan, out of them, one of Ham's sons would be servant to their brother. And we'll see how this all plays out as we go through the rest of the covenants. Then in Genesis 9.26, we see a, 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 a real good declaration that Shem will have a, a very unique relationship to the Lord. In fact, Jesus Christ would eventually become a descendant of Shem. And then finally, in Genesis 9, 27, we see a declaration that Japheth will father the largest part of the world's population. And that is an overview of the covenant of Noah. That's what's there. Next slide, please. Thank you, Lauren. So this covenant was reiterated by Paul in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Where I just broke it down into two categories. What we are to do, we're to submit ourselves to governing authorities, right? Uh, verse 13, verse 1. That governing authorities are to have laws in place that protect the sanctity of human life. And we are to obey those laws. For instance, if you murder someone, God puts the authority in human government to be able to terminate or bring a righteous judgment on the murderer by that person losing his life. Then we're to pay our taxes. You guys like that one? Throw the tea in the harbor. What's that? Yeah. Throw the tea in the harbor. 
Throw the tea in the harbor. Right. Righteous taxes are to be paid. Unrighteous taxes, as Becca said, throw the tea in the harbor. Then we're to give honor and respect to those for whom it is due. For whom it is due. So our current president, we're, I think, to address him properly as president. Um, and then we are to pray for uh, continued leadership, better leadership. Uh, and I think a, a, a spiraling upward, I hope, is what we're going to see. And then he tells us why we should do it. Because God has established human government, so to disobey human laws is to disobey God, is what Romans 13 connects there. And then there is punishment from the throne, 13 verses 3 through 5. God has also decreed that lawbreakers should be punished by those representing human government. So those in human government must comply with our own laws. If they don't, the entire structure uh, has caused to simply crumble. So when they establish laws that protect the sanctity of human life, I think they're on the right track. So let's look at our text in sl on slide six, please, Lauren. We have, um, well, Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness or the depravity of man was great in the, in the land, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So what has happened here is we've transitioned now, you know, from the, uh, where we've got the, uh, the, the uh, uh, dispensation of innocence, where God walked with man in the garden. And God and man uh, were together, and even, I think, walking and discussing things. Man chose uh, to rebel against God. That was a big mistake. Uh, Herb had a great verse there in uh, uh, James chapter 1. Uh, God didn't make him do that. Adam chose to do that. And uh, he violated God's law. He rebelled against God and that broke that covenant. Well, then it went into the, the covenant of what we call pr uh, conscience where man was ruled by his own conscience and, and dictated by what God told him. Well, we see here on the end of this uh, dispensation of conscience that Romans chapter 1 is very true, and, he, and man has seared his conscience against God. Man has rebelled against God and seared his conscience against God. This picture here is not a pretty one. God has made man by design to serve him, but man has taken that capacity given to him and rebelled and produced only evil. This verse gives insight, as I say, into what James or what Jesus explained before the flood, about the flood. For in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. No thought to God at all. No thought to God at all. And they were uh, uh, going down uh, the road. Their conscience was seared. There were no limits anymore on what they did and what they did to each other. The sanctity of human life was lost. So they were living life for themselves without regard to God. The words of Jesus, I think when he said those in Matthew 24, 38, are far more powerful than what we may realize. So God's dealings, I mean, honestly, let's look at today. Would you compare where we're at today with what the Lord Jesus said and then even all the way back to Genesis chapter 6? Are we, the Gentile world, approaching that same kind of thing? where large masses of the Gentile world have rejected God and they now live in open sin before him. I think we're there. God's dealings with Adam through the covenant in Eden and the covenant with Adam to keep things on track had failed to transcend to Adam's descendants. So God has shown us in the garden that man will rebel even when in his very presence and now, left to our own recognizance under our own conscience, uh, man will also eventually focus with full intent on evil. That's just fallen man. So God is showing us one, dispens one dispensation at a time, man's absolute inability to appear righteous before him based upon our own efforts. He is taking away every excuse, and he's doing that as is part of his master plan. So at the completion of human history, 
which is coming. Mankind, as we enter into the eternal state, will have been given every conceivable scenario to stand righteous before God and will ultimately fail in every one. Short of Jesus Christ, there is no righteousness to carry us before God. Jesus Christ is it. He's the only way. Uh, slide seven, please, Lauren. Thank you. So let's take that concept, and I want to overlay it on, um, on some passages here. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness in men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. God's wrath is righteous because of what, have been, what, have, what, have, what we have been told and shown of God it makes his wrath righteous uh, as we go through these dispensations to include the one we currently live in. This is the dispensation of grace where God has revealed himself to us as a gift of grace to us. We can put our faith in him and be saved. And yet man rejects that and walks in their own way. Uh, huge mistake. Verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. Um, for God has shown it to them. So God has revealed everything about himself to us that he wants us to know. We know everything about him that we need to know to put our faith in him. Certainly it's everything we need to know. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I was talking to Pastor Briggs this last week, and he quoted a, a doctor friend of his who said, evolution is a fairy tale for adults. It's just a fairy tale for adults. You cannot possibly look at the complexity of life to include your own human body and come to any other conclusion that God created us. You can't. You can't think that, that, that what we are... Uh, do you know how many sub... Uh, systems that are in place that, like for instance, I had a, um, a heart attack when I was 37, which is very young, uh, and it was a pretty good heart attack. Uh, I came out of it and uh, figured, well, I don't want that to happen again, and I became an avid runner. For years, I was an avid runner. About 30 years, I ran almost every day, at least three miles, and a lot of times more. And what my body did as I was running, is those arteries that were bad, my body grew new arteries, new veins, new channels for blood to flow. This was a thought out machine that had planned systems and then fail safe systems that would fail over and then subsystems that would fail over to the subsystems. This cannot possibly have ever evolved. The complexity of this, I just recently went through a a uh, 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 cancer surgery and uh, you know you, you, you look at the complexities of how all these things come together and the individual parts there's no way that I could attribute my body to anything but the creation of God that is the only way and that's what he says for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen and this is the creation that he's talking about being understood by the things that are made we cannot look at ourselves and think we evolved from goo. You cannot objectively do that and defend it. It's just a fairy tale. It lets people who don't want a relationship with God have an excuse to reject him. That's all that does. So God has taken his creation through an entire set of dispensations, and he reveals to us that no matter what God has done, we still tend to rebel against him. That's what man does. Since he has revealed all of this to anyone who would bother to look, anyone who rejects him and dies in rebellion will stand before him without excuse for their sin. There's no excuse. God will say, how about the garden? I walked with you. Well, how about the Adamic time period? I let you have your conscience. Well, how about the Noahic period? I let you have human government. None of it will be when, when the lost stand before God. Verse 21, because although they knew God, they know these bodies are created. They know that. They got the message. They did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. They seared their conscience. 
just as they did in the days of Noah, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And that's a self-inflicted wound that it's very difficult to come back from. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And that's what I say when we talk about people who are supposed scientists who get up and teach our kids that we rose from goo and that there is no God, they became fools. That's what they are. They're fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. That's what they did. And that's what they do. And birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So that's the state of man in the days of Noah. So God is showing us one dispensation at a time. Man's absolute inability to appear righteous before him based upon our own efforts. Every dispensation removes a potential opportunity to excuse our conduct. So understanding this is going to help us connect a, a very important set of dots about the covenant of Noah. Next slide, please, Lauren. We have Genesis 6, 6 here. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. Well, the, to be sorry there, or he repented that he made, doesn't suggest that God changed his mind. He's changeless. We know that. Malachi 3, 6. What he's talking about here, God loves his creation. Uh, <clears throat> and that, <clears throat> excuse me, and that love comes out clearly. But God's love for his creation doesn't stop him from fully enforcing his word. We have to realize that. Uh, that's where I was before I got saved. I would have, I was thinking, well, and I've told you this before, I would have, sit down and have a conversation with God and I would explain myself and, and, uh, and, and he would see the light. He would see the light. And we, and we would come to an agreement and I would be okay. And I'd come to find out that's not it at all. God cannot do anything but fully enforce his word. I am unrighteous before God in my own state. So in fact, fully enforcing his word is the only way that God can show love to his creation. He can share his uh, redemption to us by his love. Genesis 6, 7. Do I have that up there? Yes. Okay. So the Lord said, I will destroy or I will annihilate man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air. And this includes everything that fell in the garden, the whole creation. He says, for I'm sorry that I have made them. But, and I see this as a saving clause, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Well, why? Well, we see Hebrews 11, 7. Noah had faith in God. Doesn't mean he wasn't a sinner. I don't know what his sinful state was at the time. I've often puzzled over that. Was he, how different was he than those around him? How did his faith drive him to be different than those around him? I believe it did. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. So Noah saw these things through eyes of faith. He was moved with fear because he believed God. He believed what God said. He prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Noah believed God. And he, it drove him to um, build this ark. I, I look at this verse and I, 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 it convicts me greatly. When Granny and I pray every night, we, we, we thank the Lord for our kids who have a relationship with him, a faith-based relationship with him, because we're moved by fear for those that may not. And we pray right down to our great-grandkids, who we don't have any yet. And I don't know if we'll even be here when, when they come. Hopefully we'll all be out of here. But we want our kids, our grandkids, our great-grandkids to have a faith-based relationship with God. And we pray about that every day. Those that we don't even know. He says, by the which he condemned the world. Well, by the ark, by the building of the ark, he condemned the world. The world saw what was happening. I'm sure Noah talked in all that time where he was pounded nails. <coughs> and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith, which Noah did. So Noah condemned the world by building this ark in obedience to God in front of the world. That's what you're doing today as you preach the gospel. You're building an ark in the presence of the whole world. And the world has to make a decision. They have to make a decision just like they did in the days of Noah. The whole world watched.
watched what he was doing, but they mocked him along the way, I'm sure. And we will be too. But at any time, any of them could have picked up a hammer and joined him, but none of them did. None of them did. You see, Noah was trusting by faith in, in the covenant of Adam. Uh, and that was the commitment where God said, I will send a redeemer. So that's what Noah put his faith in. What we put our faith in is what happened on the cross. What Noah put his faith in is what would happen on the cross. Genesis 3.15. That's where it all started. So the basis of salvation in every age, to include Noah, from Adam to eternity is the death of Christ. The requirement for salvation in every age, Noah, Old Testament, me, New Testament, is faith. The object of our faith in every dispensation is Jesus Christ. That's where it is. So that coming Redeemer would be anointed Savior, Jesus Christ. What does Jesus Christ translate in English to? Jesus is what? God in the flesh. He is God in the flesh. And what does his name translate into English as? Savior. Right? Jesus means Savior. And Christ means? Anointed one. anointed one. The anointed one. He is the Savior, the anointed one, the one that God sent and the one that God accepts. Next slide, please, Lauren. Now we get to verse 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man. He had faith in God. Perfect in his generations. Doesn't mean sinless, but he walked in faith. Noah walked with God. Not physically, as they say, I think I've got my notes up there, in the way uh, in that they did in the Garden of Eden uh, for Adam and Eve, but he walked by faith because he was looking for that coming redemption that was promised to Adam and Eve. So Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Verse 11 tells me what they were doing. When we talk about being filled with violence, the violence was against each other. They did not hold their lives or human life sacred. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way in the earth. God changed course from destruction here, though, really to construction. Next slide, please, Lauren. I just missed you. All right, thank you, Daniel. I love that picture. You know what I love about that picture? Noah's about to go fishing, right? I think he's about to go fishing. Because he didn't take any fish aboard, did he? He didn't have to, because they'd be in the water. Uh, as the water rose. I think he might have cut himself out a little secret place to get a fishing pole out and do a little fishing as he was, right? Amen? Who said that? Thank you, Gus. So he was commanded to build an ark. Genesis chapter 7 tells us that Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives, plus all the animals and seven pairs of clean animals got on board and the door was sealed. Outside the ark, the waters burst forth for 40 days. It's a long rainstorm, covering the highest of mountains and, 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 and it drowning all human and animal life. Just, it was gone. But then the water receded and the ark settled back down to solid ground. And that's where we're going to pick up our story again. <coughs> Next slide, please. Thank you, Daniel. Genesis 8, 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. This is after they got out of the, um, out of the ark and took every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now, verse 20 is interesting, but when you go back to, um, uh, oh, I bet I can't find it right off the top of my head, but remember he took extra clean animals. There was extra pairs. So he had them to do this very thing. God foresaw the need and he put... And he provided the need. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And nor uh, will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, 
uh, and day and night shall not cease. We see here why the extra clean animals were brought. Like I say, on board, Noah offered a, a burnt offering on the altar, and the first priority when he got off the ark was to give thanks. And I like that uh, Herb's focus on that when we pray. First thing we do is praises and thanks. I think that pattern was set all the way back to the time of Noah. Uh, next slide, please, Daniel. Here we go to Genesis 9, 1. So God blessed Noah and his sons. And I am reading off of the Korean side. <laughs> and said to them, Thou shalt not lie. Be fruitful and multiply. And fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth. On every bird of the air and on all that move on the earth and all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. There was no food restrictions right now, but we'll see them come forth in the Mosaic Covenant. For a specific reason. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. What do you think that included? Spinach. No. Broccoli. No. Brussels sprouts. No. <laughs> no. I read green herbs as being a hamburger. That's how I interpret that. Okay? Go back to the ancient, ancient Hebrew. But you shall not eat uh, flesh with its life, that is its blood. Okay, surely for your life blood I will demand a reckoning. So again, as they get off the boat and they're, and they're talking here, we see God proclaiming to them the sanctity of human life. Your life is sacred to him. Sacred. Your life is sacred to God. He died for your life. You're sitting here today because you have put your eternal destiny under his control by putting your faith in him. Your life is sacred to him. That's how much he loves you. I just, I, I'm amazed at how many times that God says this to us. Surely for your lifeblood, I will demand a reckoning because your life is sacred to him. From the hand of every beast, I will require it. And when you, when you read on into the Mosaic law, you find out that if an animal kills a human being, there is a reckoning. When a human kills a human being, there is a reckoning. For the, at, for the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Life is sacred. Your life, your, as you sit here today, your life is so sacred to God because he died for you. He shed his blood for you. Verse 6, whosoever shed man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. Human life is a sacred, sacred thing. Then in verse 13, in these verses we see, oh, can you go to the next one, please? Thank you. Genesis 9, 4. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. It isn't that the, the blood is bad for you. It's not a dietary issue that the Lord is talking about. <coughs> <clears throat> Honestly, every piece of meat you eat is going to have some blood in it, isn't it? There's no way to get it all out. Eating, uh, how many Germans in here? How many of you ate blood sausage when you were kids? It's terrible. I'm telling you, it's the worst thing. Because they take, they, uh, see, when my grandpa, he would do all, uh, uh, all the prep. My dad, my dad loved this stuff. They would hang the pig and drain the blood out of the pig by slitting the throat and catch it in a bucket. And then they would make, they'd take the liver and the kidneys and all, and cut that all up into pieces, mix it into blood. Miso, do they do that in Korea? Do they make sausage out of blood? They do? We're not moving to Korea. So then they would make sausage out of this, and then we would eat the sausage. And every bite, you would just shudder because you knew what you were eating. It was terrible. But he's saying here, eating, uh, and by the way, it didn't kill me. I'm still here. Uh, I just thought I would die. Uh, you may want to die when you taste it. Any focus on health concerns in these verses misses the point. Misses the point. What God is stressing here is the importance and the sanctity of human life. 
That's what he's stressing here. You see, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And if you shed someone's blood, then by you, by man, shall your blood be shed. This is not a dietary restriction. What God is stressing here is the sanctity of human life. Slide 14, please, Lauren. Leviticus 17.10. Now, this is a long read, but I'd like to do it. Uh, and whatever man of the house of Israel or the strangers who dwell among you who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among the people. Why is 17, or check 17 verse 10 true? What's his point? Why would he cut him off? Why would he cut him off? What has the person that ate blood done? Committed a sin, right? Committed a, committed a sin but what is the sin? The sin is that the person did not see the sanctity of life. And that's what he's stressing. And that's what I, I did. If you walk out of here with anything today, your life is so sacred to God that if anybody touches you, God will require justice for what they do to you. He will require justice. He loves you that much. Verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So it would be the blood of Jesus that atones for our souls. And that's what this is pointing to. He shed his blood that I may not need to shed my own. He took my place on that cross. Therefore I said to the children of Israel, no one among you shall eat blood, nor shall any stranger who dwells among you eat blood. Whatever man of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you, those are the Gentiles, um, and, and there were some uh, proselytes that came across, who hunts and catches any animal or bird that may be eaten, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh. Its blood sustains its life. Therefore, I said to the children of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any flesh. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and life is sacred. Life is sacred. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. Your life is that sacred to God. Next slide, please, Lauren. And every person who eats uh, what died naturally, you, know, you, you come across a critter in the woods and you're hungry, or, or what is torn by beasts, whether he be a native of your country or a stranger. He shall both wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Then he shall be clean. But if he does not wash them or bathe his body, then he shall bear his guilt. God is going to hold those that don't hold life as sacred accountable for what they do. They're accountable for what they do. He takes it that seriously. So to eat blood was to... Hold the death of the coming Redeemer who would shed his blood in contempt. That's what's going on here. Making it a very serious offense and one that the violator would answer for. To reject Jesus Christ is to reject his shed blood on the cross. And that is to make what is sacred in their mind as worthless or not, not redeemed. It's just not worth acknowledging. Next slide, please, Lauren. Surely for your life, blood, I will demand a reckoning. Again, we see in the Noahic Covenant, God is stressing the importance of the sanctity of your very life. God loves you. If you were the only human being that ever walked the earth, God would have died for you. And now he's died for, how many around the world today, do you think? Is it 10 billion? Are we there? 8 billion? 6 billion? Six billion? Okay. Anthropologists think that when you, when you total all that have gone on for the 6,000 years, anthropologists I trust, it's over 10 billion total uh, souls that we're talking about here. And by the way, anthropologists, a uh, trivia question for you guys. What is the average age of death for the human being over the last 6,000 years? 70? Oh, no. That's close. 30? 30? You're closer. Seven. Seven. It I is. Remember you saying it actually. Oh, you said it from I said it. Right. If you account for abortion, you account for starvation, you account for war, 
Do you realize that the United States of America has no clue to the slaughter that's going on in, in Africa this very moment? It's very sad. Yeah, slaughter. Thousands are being slaughtered over there by, by, by Muslim militants. The average age of death for the human being over the last 6,000 years is estimated to be seven years old. Seven. We live in a bubble here that they're trying to burst real bad. Okay? We live in a bubble. So we need to keep that bubble going. The sanctity within our own country. When I look at these verses, how do you translate that then to um, uh, where we're at today in our own country, by the way? Under our own government, uh, there's a successful campaign of death today. Right? One of the major U.S. political parties is making the right to protect the right to kill an unborn child the number one item on the election agenda. What do we see in the Noahic Covenant? God says human life is sacred, and those that take those lives will answer for it. They'll answer for it. That strategy, unfortunately, in our own country has worked in past elections. And I think that's because we need to be more vocal in our stand, uh, preaching the gospel. But I think it tells you where our country is on this issue. They have hidden the, the I guess the, uh, you know, I, we have kids in the room, so I just would say the death of these unborn children behind phrases like right to choose, or pro-life, or reproductive rights. Fetus. Yeah, and changing the name. Fetus. Yeah, a lot of witty words, right? A human being, a fetus. Yeah. yeah. So they've twisted the words on. I don't think I got that up on the slide. Where we're told to love our neighbor as ourselves, they twist that verse into saying that God is okay with killing our unborn. And that actually doing it is taught by Jesus as an act of love. How twisted can we get? Our elderly. How many of you consider yourselves to be in that category? Okay, not very many hands, yeah. There's a few of us, right? There's an assault on us to eliminate us because we're unproductive and unnecessary and we're using limited resources that younger folks need to have. So different terms such as completed life before life is completed, tiredness of life, life fatigue, they've been used to cover over what is actually being done. Elderly people are being abused in a terrible way in that. If God removes his blessing from our country because of our disdain for the sanctity of life, and he may have already done so, mm -hmm. can we remain a free and a powerful nation? No. I say no. I'm with Lauren. I say no. Our nation needs to come back to a view of the sanctity of life. We need to protect our unborn. I believe that when someone takes a human life, the government ought to hold them accountable to the point where that life is also taken. That's what I believe. Otherwise, life is not sacred. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, I just have always thought, because you know, a woman gets, you know, an abortion, mm -hmm. not charged with murder, but if the woman who, like, let's say she's four weeks pregnant, gets shot and dies, it's a double homicide. It is a double homicide. We have a double standard there, don't we? Yeah. Now, for, the, for those that have gotten abortions, what do we need to do? Preach the gospel. These people, these poor ladies that have been duped into this by our own government, struggle more after that than can be ever imagined. I know even back in the 80s, when we were stationed in North Dakota at Grand Forks, we became active in, in this, and uh, our, the, the state, North Dakota, was spending more money helping women who had gotten abortion than getting the abortion. Because they fell into this terrible trap, this terrible deceit, that it is, as Becca was saying, only a bunch of cells. Sacred life, that's what they are. They're each a sacred life. If Christians in our country lose the battle over the sanctity of life, the form of government we eventually will live under will be similar to what we see in China, Russia, and other dark places in the world. I find that acceptable for my kids, my grandkids, and my great-grandkids. That's not acceptable. As this battle for life goes, so goes life in our country. 
And I rest that statement on the covenant with Noah and what God said about the sanctity of life. Next slide, please, Lauren. That's where our support through prayer and our work in Life Network. Kirsten is our point of contact with Life Network. That's our focus to save the unborn. And Capital Ministries is our focus on our politicians. We elect pro-life politicians. And when we send them to represent us, we want them to represent a pro-life stand. That's what we want. In fact, that's what we demand. So these ministries give legs to our prayers. So we're taking up a you know, collection, ex any extra change you might want to put in to support Capital Ministries, and that's today and next Sunday. Now the month of April, we'll be doing the same thing to support the Life Network thing in town. So we see in the covenant with Noah, the transition from the age of conscience under the Adamic covenant to the age of human government. Human government would now be what God uses to hold human nature in check. But I say when human government gets off track and now no longer holds human life as sacred, they're no longer a godly government. And it's time we, the voters, stand up and say, I don't think so. So let's uh, remember that as we go to the ballot box. You know, it's a few months away, but there's no time like now to plan it out. Uh, again, I think God is showing us one dispensation at a time. Man's absolute inability to appear righteous before him based on our own efforts. Uh, now under the Noahic Covenant, God is going to be given a... The, give, man is given the authority to implement this covenant as the representative of God. Go to the next slide, please. Thank you, Lauren. So he says, as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Um... Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. Remember what happened in the Garden of Eden? Eve was uh, a part of her, her, her piece of that action was multiple births and I think multiple at a time births. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him saying, And as for me, behold, I established my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, which is us. That's where human government has transcended the, 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 the ages to our time. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, cattle, and beasts of the earth, all that should go out to have come out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud. Anybody here not seen a rainbow? Every time we see a rainbow, this is God telling us of his commitment to his covenant here. The covenant of human government to protect the sanctity of human life. That's what that rainbow means. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. That rainbow is not the sign we see it used for today. That rainbow is a sign of God saying life is sacred. Human life is sacred. And those that take it must answer for that. Slide 19, please. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. So God is good to his word. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And as I, as I say in my notes here, that those who choose a lifestyle that God rejects, have chosen his very symbol to say that God is okay with what they're doing. And I assure you, he is not. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan, which Herb just read this morning. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. So the sons of Noah would see many, I'm sure, multiple births. 
due to the covenant with Adam that God made with Adam and Eve. And it wouldn't take long to see great numbers of people in the land. Now, did they stay on track? Did they, the next thing you find them doing is building a tower, right? I mean, it's just this. Can we not get this right? Next slide, please, Lauren. The Noahic covenant, I think, has directly affected how you and I live today. This is the Declaration of Independence, which I believe is a very special document, and I just want to read that as we, as we close. This is our own government when it was formed. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. In other words, life is sacred. And they saw their lives as no longer being treated as sacred. A, decent, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Where did that statement come from? Not Joe Biden. Not Joe Biden. It came from the covenant with Noah. That's where that came from. All men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are what? Life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They are sacred because they were ordained of God that we should have them. These guys didn't make it up. It came right out of the scriptures, God's own words, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted amongst men, right? That's why Noah made government, that life would be held sacred. Governments are instituted among men to secure that right deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So we have a representative form of government, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles, the sanctity of life, and organizing its powers in such form as to them uh, shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Their lives are sacred, and that's what government is supposed to hold, too. So then the next slide, please, Lauren. So, yeah, I guess I've got the rest of that. I'm, my voice is getting fady, so Jose, could you read that to us, please? <coughs> the whole thing? Yes. Boom it out. <laughs> okay. So, therefore, representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the restitute of our rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, and that they are absolved absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown and that all pol political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war and conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Thank you, Jose. With a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. And we have had that for 200 plus years. But now we come to a time in our nation's history where uh, the sanctity of life has been strayed from to a significant level. And we need to bring that back. Next slide, please. Many of the Signers, the founders of this country, were familiar with their Bibles. And they knew that the covenant with Noah was God's method of establishing human government. I believe what they did was well within the bounds God set forth as what a human government should look like. 
Our government was designed to protect its citizens from our own and each other's human nature. And we have done so until recently. And we need to pray that our leaders and our fellow citizens turn to God, that we repent of our national sins. Before we must do what the Declaration of Independence said and replace the government before it becomes so destructive. So the definition of the, 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 Noah, the Noahic Covenant gave to us, human government, the ability to protect our own and each other's lives. Human life is sacred to God. And that's what based, our government was based upon. Next slide, please, Lauren. This is our conclusion, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are all found in Jesus Christ. So far in our studies of the covenants, we have found that the covenant in Edom, which was called the Age of Innocence, the covenant with Adam, which was called the Age of Conscience, where they lived by their conscience, and the covenant with Noah, which is the Age of Human Government, have all failed to make us righteous before God. So God has systematically removed any thought on our part that we could justify ourselves before God. It must be done through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That is a sacred, a sanctified thing that he did for us as he died for us on the cross. Next slide, please, Lauren. There's only one way to stand justified before God. And that path is through Jesus Christ. Uh, we're to put our faith in Jesus. Noah did. Noah had faith. Hebrews 11, 7. And you can stand righteous before God in that day if you put your faith in Jesus Christ to save your soul. Seeing your need for a Savior. And if you do that, please let me know so we can talk and get you off on the right track. And, you know, a discipleship effort to show you what the scripture says about your new life in Christ. Now slide 26. That is the, what is that? Conclusion. That is the conclusion. It is the Declaration of Independence in Korean. Right? Next slide, please. That is the Declaration of Independence in Cambodian. Same words. Next slide, please. This is it in Chinese. As we have right here. Ray, can you read Chinese? <laughs> I, I've heard that one up there that says Chinese. Chinese. <laughs> Chinese. <laughs> Next. July 4th. July 4th. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. This is. No, no, go back. July 4th, 1776. Okay, this is it in Spanish. Right? You know what? They all say the same thing. They all say the same thing. You know what? In every language that this Bible is published, Jesus Christ is the way. In every language. And in every place around the world, life is sacred. And when God comes back, it will be so. I reckon so. I think it's amazing. And I have kept you three minutes past our time. I'm sorry. I just, uh, this, this one, I wanted to do all in a chunk rather than spend two weeks on Noah. Uh, any questions or thoughts? Okay, so the one thought I want you to take from here is in the covenant of Noah, God holds human life as sacred. Your life is sacred before God. Very sacred. And, uh, and uh, we're just going to go, we'll just do a loop here. And, uh, and we'll start with Ray, and then we'll go to John and come around to... Uh, let's do Jose, and then we'll close with Justin in the back. If you guys would close us in prayer. Lord, we want to thank you for this time together as a church family. We uh, thank you for this building. Thank you for the freedom that we have to be here. Thank you for the life that you give us for us, Lord. We ask that you continue to protect the lives of everyone out there and uh, continue to be with us and have uh, this message to us encouraged to go forth and uh, continue spreading your gospel, Lord. We ask for these things in your name. Heavenly Father, thanks so much for your
Father, for being amongst us and for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, uh, we are grateful for the message we received today. Uh, truly, Lord, what you have called clean, let no man call unclean. What you have called sanctified and holy, let no man call unsanctified and unholy. For you have sanctified life. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to stand in the way that you want us to stand, in a way that will uh, proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. This is the area, Lord, we need your wisdom, we need your help, and we ask for your guidance. 